Good evening, everybody. I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Tom Yamas tonight. The wounds of a nation scarred by relentless gun violence torn open once more, a place where people go to heal turned into a site of carnage. Anguish clear on the faces of those evacuated from St. Francis Hospital. That's after a gunman shot and killed four people inside. That shooting coming just eight days after the horror in Uvalde. Many of the 21 victims killed at Robb Elementary School not even buried before the next tragedy struck. And President Biden addressed the recent string of mass shootings in a speech tonight. We'll have a look at those remarks in just a moment, but we begin first in Tulsa. NBC's Blaine Alexander is there. The first calls were chilling. We're gonna have to get in this door. I don't know if it's him, but I can see blood and I can hear somebody moaning. An orthopedic office on the campus of St. Francis Hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma, now the latest scene of a mass shooting. Police say the gunman, 45-year-old Michael Lewis, walked into his doctor's office late Wednesday, armed with two guns and a vendetta. Police say he recently had back surgery. His surgeon, Dr. Preston Phillips. Police later found a letter on the gunman laying out his clear target and motive. He came in with the intent to kill Dr. Phillips and anyone who got in his way. He blamed Dr. Phillips for the ongoing pain following the surgery. After his surgery in late May, the gunman called the office repeatedly, police said, complaining of pain, even going back for a follow-up appointment. May 29th, three days before the shooting, he legally purchased a handgun. Then on Wednesday, police say he called the office repeatedly, later that day buying an AR-15 rifle just three hours before the attack. The suspect, when he came into the building, into that office complex, he began firing he began firing at anyone that was in his way. Officers were on the scene within five minutes. As they approached, police say the gunman turned the weapon on himself. The Tulsa Police Department uh, responded very quickly, and without that quick response, this could have been a much bigger situation. Still, four victims were left in his wake. Amanda Glenn, a receptionist, and Dr. Stephanie Hewson, both loved by their colleagues. William Love, a patient in the office. The family of Mr. Love, I'm so sorry we couldn't save you. And Dr. Preston Phillips, killed in an exam room. Sam Combs is a longtime friend and patient. To have a doctor who prays with you and for you before and after your surgery, that was Preston. And Blaine Alexander joins us now from Tulsa. Uh, Blaine, let's talk about Oklahoma's gun laws if we can. That state actually has an anti-red flag law, right? That's right, Aaron. In fact, it's something that bans any community here in Oklahoma from passing any sort of law that would allow authorities to seize guns from people that could be a danger to themselves or others. It's something that's been on the books here in Oklahoma since 2020. Aaron. Blaine Alexander in Tulsa for us tonight. Blaine, thank you. Now to Texas and a disturbing new claim tonight about 911 calls made inside Robb Elementary School as 19 children and two teachers were being gunned down. Plus new details about the investigation of the gunman there. Here's NBC's Morgan Chesky. I can only say, I can only say we are sorry. Tonight, State Senator Roland Gutierrez sharing stunning new details about a communication breakdown. The 911 calls were not being communicated to the so-called incident commander. Gutierrez says those calls first went to Uvalde police and not Pete Arredondo, the school's chief of police, in charge of the response, who told officers to wait. To know the one person who should have been receiving those 911 calls was not being briefed. How big of a failure? Do you see here? This is a tremendous failure. ISD level, school police, state troopers, federal government, even for the federal agents that were here, they still waited. New search warrants obtained by NBC News painting a grim picture of the gunman's arsenal. In his pickup truck alone, investigators recovered a Smith & Wesson M&P 15 rifle, the initial standing for military and police. Also inside, 15 rifle magazines, each loaded and capable of holding up to 30 rounds. How heavy is the heart of Uvalde? Extremely heavy. Local pastor Julian Moreno has called Uvalde home for decades, living just blocks from Robb Elementary, where he stood outside last Tuesday and prayed. I asked God for a miracle, and I said, if it doesn't happen, give me the strength to overcome. Hoping for a miracle for everyone inside, 
including his great-granddaughter, Lexi Rubio, who didn't make it out. Lexi was a beautiful child. She loved to go to school. Uh, she loved her grandma's chicken tacos. And tonight, Pastor Moreno telling me he is now preparing to preside over the funeral service of his own great-granddaughter. Morgan Chesky in Texas tonight. Morgan, thank you. From the grieving community there in Uvalde to the White House, where President Biden addressed the nation tonight to call for new gun laws. NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has the details. President Biden, who has grieved with families traumatized by mass shootings, tonight implored Congress and our communities to change. Enough. Enough. It's time for each of us to do our part. It's time to act. Making a rare evening address to the nation, a glow from candles for each state and territory touched by gun violence. More kids than on-duty cops killed by guns. More kids than soldiers killed by guns. For God's sake, how much more carnage are we willing to accept? The president's call to action reflected the political reality in Congress that passing any kind of gun-related reforms may mean incremental steps. And if we can't ban assault weapons, then we should raise the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. The divide in Congress is stark. Why don't they feel an urgency to do something. You are not going to bully your way into stripping Americans of fundamental rights. A Florida Republican on camera from home during today's hearing brandished his own handgun. Here's a gun I carry every single day to protect myself, my family. His display alarmed colleagues. I hope the gun, the gun is not loaded. I'm at my house. I can do whatever I want with my guns. Gun safety negotiations are moving with new urgency. House Democrats expect to vote next week to raise the age to buy semi-automatic weapons and set red flag restrictions barring weapons from those deemed dangerous. While much of the focus is on the bipartisan Senate talks that so far have the backing of Republican leader Mitch McConnell, but he wants more limited issues. Mental illness and school safety or what we need to target. Now, with the president calling on Congress to pass tougher gun laws, I want to bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale now with more on those negotiations. Uh, Ali, after the, the Buffalo shooting, it seemed like the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer was not even going to try to get a bill through. Now we have this group of uh, senators, this bipartisan group of senators in talks, talks now. Who are the key players here and what gun regulations are on the table at this point? Yeah, Aaron, this is really a situation of these bipartisan talks being a question of both who's doing the negotiating and also who's blessing the negotiations. In terms of who's actually at the negotiating table, you have Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy, who has long been in this fight for gun, vi gun violence prevention legislation. He's alongside Kirsten Sinema, Joe Manchin, and Pat Toomey on the Republican side. These are names that have long been in the conversation around gun violence prevention legislation. But the other name that's important in the mix here is Senator John Cornyn, the Republican from Texas. The reason it's important that he's part of these negotiations, and really he's on a parallel track of negotiations aside from a larger group of bipartisan senators, uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has blessed Cornyn to have these conversations with Republicans and Democrats alike. The fact that the Senate Minority Leader is on board saying that these conversations should happen is notable, and it's part of the reason why some people feel more optimistic that something could happen at this point, even as we've seen so many of these tragedies lead to no change on Capitol Hill. You mentioned Senator Murphy there, Ali. He wrote an op-ed uh, on foxnews.com today and said in part, uh, quote, my Republican colleagues and I don't agree on much, but this time I'm hopeful we can agree on this. Inaction cannot be our answer. So, and you alluded to it, but based on what you're hearing from your sources, how optimistic are negotiators about actually getting something done in the Senate? 
Karen, it's so tough to gauge because so many of these people have been burned before. Even someone like Senator Murphy, who has worked on this legislation time and time again, only to see talks fall apart. He says that right now he feels optimistic because for Democrats, they're starting at such a point that the changes they're demanding are somewhat moderate compared to the things that they've asked for in the past. He has even said, Murphy has even said, that he doesn't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. And it's why we're seeing not a conversation around things like assault weapons bans or even raising the age limit. That's not part of the conversation, at least not right now. Instead, what we're seeing this bipartisan group of negotiators focus on are things that we hear often from Republicans, like school safety and mental health, but also going a step further and talking about, about background checks, as well as red flag laws that could just be incentivizing states to put in place programs that would allow guns to be taken away on a temporary basis by court order or by police if that's flagged up to law enforcement and the courts. Those are right now the moderate changes that are being discussed. But again, our sources tell us that they have a framework right now that might be enough for them to all come back to Washington next week in the Senate and actually have a real debate on what to do here. You know, I want to ask you, too, about the House while we have you. The Judiciary Committee there took up an issue today in the hopes of, of trying to bring a package of yeah. gun violence prevention bills to the floor next week. Uh, can you walk us through some of that effort? Yeah, a late night for the House Judiciary Committee. They are back in an emergency session marking up a package of bills on gun violence prevention, including things like raising the age to buy a semi-automatic rifle from 18 to 21, as well as another law about red flags that would, again, incentivize states to create those programs. That's one piece of this that could actually make it through the Senate because it matches and is a parallel with what the Senate group of negotiators are talking about. But really the reality here, Aaron, is the House Judiciary Committee is going to mark up this bill. They're going to send it to the Rules Committee, ideally for Tuesday, and then the full House will vote on it Wednesday or Thursday. The important thing, though, after that is it's probably going to languish in the Senate. That's why so much of this hinges on what this bipartisan group of negotiators can hash out and if there's any commonality that they can find. Because even if the House passes this, it doesn't mean it's going to pass the Senate. We've seen this happen way too many times before. We know you'll be tracking whatever movements do happen here from, uh, from the Hill. Ali Vitale with us tonight. Ali, thank you. And tonight, the Biden administration announcing that pending regulatory approval, the nation's 18 million children under the age of five could begin receiving the first doses of COVID vaccines as early as June 21st. Here to explain more is NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel. Uh, Dr. Patel, we appreciate you being with us tonight. Uh, you know, I, I talked to a parent today who is eager to get her four-year-old vaccinated. There are some parents out there, moms and dads, who are frustrated that are going to be watching tonight wondering, you know, medically speaking, what took so long for this to happen? Yeah, Aaron, one word, Omicron. So mm. this was, a, but both Moderna and Pfizer had had trials planned and ongoing. And then with the Omicron surge, those that created a different dynamic. One, where we knew that the immunity from these vaccines would not be like they were in adults because adults' immunity from vaccines decreased against Omicron. And then number two, Aaron, they're trying to show with trials that these have significant differences. But children, if they're infected and have mild disease, you have children who might be vaccinated or might receive the placebo. And luckily, we don't have as many children in the hospital in this age group. But you also need to try to do enough of the trial to look for safety signals. So bottom line, Omicron created a kind of a chink in the armor hmm. to try to do this rapidly and created the need for Pfizer to do a third dose. And that's exactly what happened and why it took longer. OK, so you talk about the trials, right? What, what does the science tell us about how kids responded to these vaccines and, and what kind of protection they provide? Yeah, so let's talk about safety, because as a parent, that's probably one of our most important concerns. We did not see in the trial data that was released so far. We'll see more data in the coming days, but we did not see any data with serious adverse events. The most common symptoms and signs after vaccine were some local tenderness and some fevers, which we would expect. We see this with other vaccines. In terms of how well this vaccine worked, Pfizer, three shots. Very small amount of data they released in a press release. There's more data that will be in the FDA packet for regulatory review. But they report an 80 percent efficacy or 80 percent reduction of risk of infection against people who are not vaccinated. Moderna had a 37 to 51 percent 
but it's not apples to apples. Moderna mm -hmm. had a two dose vaccine and Pfizer had a three dose vaccine and Pfizer was reporting a smaller number in the trial. So bottom line though, Aaron, it's incredible news because what do parents have right now? Zero. Yeah. So we, I'm really looking forward to having these options for families. What do you think about boosters here? Do you think that a booster at some point is going to be likely, you know, both for th this new group of kids that will be able to get shots and, and for the rest of us, too? Yeah, look, Aaron, I do think I am actually hopeful. I'm in this group of adults that probably like you wondering, hey, when do we get a fourth shot? Yeah, hey, right. when do we get a fourth <laughs> shot? And, and I think we're going to see that we will likely need another shot. And that's because the ability to develop those tailored vaccines, which I'm looking forward to, are probably not going to yield vaccines until late fall. But we already know that we should anticipate another fall surge, maybe as early as September. Now, in terms of children, we have already seen the FDA, just to remind people, 5 to 11, they have authorized a booster in that group. That's a third shot. For the under five group, we see three shots in Pfizer. It's not going to be for a while till we have an understanding whether we need a fourth shot there. And a third shot for Moderna is in trials right now. So bottom line, we're going to get more data on under five and whether they need another booster. Adults are probably going to need a fourth shot. And this might become something of like a regular seasonal shot, like the flu shot, Aaron. Yeah. So stay tuned. We'll have more news as it comes out. All right. We'll be turning to you to get that when it does come out. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you. Thank you. Well, just in tonight, as gas prices hit another new record today, President Biden expected to travel to Saudi Arabia this month in an effort to repair relations with that oil-rich nation. This comes as OPEC agrees to step up, uh, step up production, but will it be enough to ease the pain at the pump? Here's NBC's Tom Costello. With gas prices setting new record highs every day, sources tell NBC News President Biden is expected to travel to Saudi Arabia later this month and expected to meet with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The news comes after intense diplomatic efforts. And on the same day, OPEC and 10 allies unexpectedly said they will modestly increase oil production by 648,000 barrels a day in July and August. For months, the Saudis have refused U.S. requests to pump more to bring gas prices down. Since taking office, the Biden administration has tried to isolate the kingdom following the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Today, most oil analysts appeared skeptical that the extra oil announced so far is enough to lower pump prices. The national average today hit yet another record, 4.71 a gallon. Eight states now pay more than $5 a gallon, 6.21 in California. Let's see, 76 bucks. Look at that. That's terrible. Driving fuel prices higher, China now emerging from its latest COVID lockdowns and Europe agreeing to cut Russian oil imports arriving by sea to finalize a ban on almost 90 percent of all Russian oil imports by the end of the year. But with inflation soaring, will Americans decide the pain at the pump is too much? We think at about $5.20 a gallon. That's when U.S. consumers might decide to keep their SUV in the garage. So Tom Costello joins us now. Tom, uh, what can we expect President Biden to try to accomplish with this trip to Saudi Arabia? Well, clearly he is trying to slow and reverse skyrocketing gas prices and doing that with the Saudis, hoping that they will increase oil production uh, even more. There's another objective here. They've got the midterm elections coming up in November. Skyrocketing gas prices is not going to be, be good for that. And he's trying to isolate Russia. Now, as you know, there's been this moral outrage over the killing of uh, Jamal Khashoggi. And so many experts say this is kind of now the, the triumph, if you will, for better or worse, of real politic over the moral outrage of that murder. Aaron. Tom Costello in Washington. Thank you, Tom. Now we turn overseas to the war in Ukraine. Russian forces gaining momentum in the east, bombing cities and towns and leaving residents without supplies. Richard Engel is on the ground with their emotional stories of survival. Ukrainian towns and cities are falling to Russia's advance. Russia has the momentum in the east, and Russian troops are just a mile from the village of Siversk. A few days ago here, we met 11-year-old Arthur by his school that Russian troops had just bombed. He suffers from anemia, and without his medicine, everything is in short supply. He often feels weak and nauseous. Is that your stomach? How are you? We returned to Siversk today. We brought something. We brought some medicine. Thank you. You are welcome. Has it been bothering you 
Ну, периодически так, иногда. Артур и his mother Лили were in a rush on their way to pick up supplies. These are the new bread lines in Europe, thanks to Russia's invasion. Ukrainian volunteers drove 17 hours to bring bread and other staples. This is the only pharmacy now. Because of all the shelling, no new supplies are coming into this village except what the volunteers bring, and that disappears quite quickly. This is one of the only shops that's still open. I'm curious to see if they have anything left on the shelves. No power like everywhere else. Lubov has been working in the shop for 20 years. Вот, и очень хочется, чтобы это все быстрее кончилось. Но это было просто ужасно, то, что с нами случилось, мы не понимаем. Can I ask you to do one thing? Will you just look right into this camera and tell our audience, Americans, and not just Americans, what it's like to be here? Страшно нам жить в таких условиях, очень страшно каждую минуту. Боимся прилетов, боимся за родных и близких, боимся не дожить до победы. Мы хотим дожить до победы. Thank you. The reason they're so worried is that Russian troops are advancing all around them and may try to take over their village next. Richard Engel, NBC News, Kramatorsk, Ukraine. For more insight on where the war in Ukraine stands now, I want to bring in NBC News military analyst and retired four-star General Barry McCaffrey. Uh, General McCaffrey, we appreciate you being with us tonight. Do you have a sense of whether the Russians are, are making real progress toward sort of smaller goals in eastern Ukraine? Well, certainly that report by Richard Engel is painful to listen to and observe. The Russians are smashing Ukraine's civilian infrastructure. They fired more than 2,500 cruise missiles, uh, largely into Ukrainian cities and villages. Uh, they have a preponderance of air power, five to one over the Ukrainians. They have a massive artillery force that is now trying to grind into the dust the elite of the Ukrainian army, which is fighting in the east near Donbass. Uh, so Ukraine's in great peril. The Russians are making advances. Uh, they do have immensely more resources to you know, funnel into the fight than the Ukrainians do. So it's, it's certainly vital that the U.S., the U.K., France, and other NATO allies funnel technology into the fight that allows the Ukrainians to survive the coming 90 days. Uh, we are pro providing them with some HIMARS rockets. Mm -hmm. They go out to around 43 miles, precision munitions. Uh, we are sending them a, a, allegedly four Grey Eagle drones. Uh, but it all sounds sort of like micro response to a, a life or death struggle. You know, we saw that President Zelensky uh, did an interview earlier this week, and he said that the Ukrainians are losing uh, 60 to 100 soldiers a day with many more wounded. These seem like significant losses, and yet the Russians are not making, you know, huge gains as, as they're moving. Is there any, any notion that there's a sort of a stalemate as to whether, uh, you know, where neither side can claim a, a big victory? Well, of course, the problem with stalemate is that the stalemate until it isn't. And mm -hmm. armies do suffer catastrophic losses and they break. Uh, certainly the Russian forces have suffered incredible casualties, up to 25 percent of the invading force. And that's primarily in infantry and armor, equipment and personnel. So the Russians are not in good shape and their leadership uh, is lousy. So you... But Ukraine is, I think, on the edge. There's no question. It's a nation in arms. They have tremendous spirit. They have brilliant leadership. Uh, they need uh, us to feed high-technology equipment into the fight more quickly than I think we are. All right, General Barry McCaffrey, we appreciate your time and expertise tonight. Thank you. Good to be with you. Now, back here at home, we're tracking severe weather, millions experiencing heavy rain and flash flooding in the mid-Atlantic. And we are also following some action in the tropics that will likely become a tropical storm before taking aim at South Florida. Let's get to NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns now. He's tracking this for us. Bill, what's the latest? 
And it looks like Florida is going to get hit, likely by a tropical storm. I mean, here we are already in the beginning of our season. We will likely have Alex in the next couple of days, likely tomorrow. And then it looks like Friday night into Saturday, the worst effects heading to Florida. So let's break it down and show you exactly what we're dealing with. Now, as of now, this is not a tropical cyclone yet. They're calling this a potential tropical cyclone. When I say they, that's the National Hurricane Center in Miami. And it's located kind of near Cosmel, right near the Cancun area here in the northern portion of the Yucatan. And it's going to move over water. That's warm enough, but thankfully the winds in the upper levels are still strong enough to keep it disorganized. So this, the odds of this becoming a hurricane are very, very slim, likely just a tropical storm. And it will drift towards Florida as we go throughout the next 12 to 24 hours. Then it accelerates on Saturday. So Saturday at 2 a.m. out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico by about 2 p.m. somewhere near Fort Myers. Now it will be a landfall, but it's not going to be like a hurricane with an eye. So it'll likely just cross the coast. You could be far away from the center and still have the worst effects of the heavy rain and wind. That's what happens in these weaker type storms. And then it will accelerate out into the Atlantic. As of now, it looks like keep an eye on it. All our friends in the Carolina coastal area, Sunday does not look good in the beaches from Charleston to Myrtle Beach, but it looks like most of the storm will miss you to the south. Now, as far as how accurate are we, you know, confidence-wise, all of our extended computer models do take it out to sea south of the Carolinas, but right over our line between Tampa and Miami, almost over the top of Lake Okeechobee. So we have a tropical storm watch that is up. This will likely go to a tropical storm morning, early tomorrow morning, and it looks like the highest winds will be up to 55 miles per hour, and that will include areas like Kilo Largo in Miami to West Palm Beach, uh, Fort Lauderdale and Fort Pierce included. It looks like south of Tampa and Orlando is where the main impacts will be. North of that, you probably will barely even know there's a storm out there. And the number one problem we're going to see with this storm is heavy rainfall. And here, Florida has sandy soil, so it's able to soak up a lot of the rain. But if we do get 8 to 10 inches of rain, we will see a lot of the you know, ponding and puddles and flash flooding on the highway. So that'll probably be the worst of it. All right. We'll keep an eye on it, Bill Cairns. We appreciate you. Thanks. And still ahead tonight, the suspect in that Buffalo supermarket shooting in court. The 25-count indictment against him, including one charge that no defendant in New York has faced before. Plus, the nationwide formula shortage is worsening, but the FDA says relief is on the way when a massive haul of formula is set to hit shelves. And influenced by social media, the argument by Amber Heard's lawyers as they vow an appeal of that defamation verdict. Stay with us. Back now with the growing fallout 24 hours after that bombshell verdict in the Johnny Depp defamation case. Depp's ex-wife, Amber Heard's lawyer, saying today they plan to appeal, claiming the jury was influenced by social media. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has the latest now from Virginia. Before the legions of cheering Johnny Depp fans even cleared the courthouse, the attorneys by Amber Heard's side decided to appeal, saying today on Today, the actress doesn't have the cash to cover the defamation verdict. Is she able to pay a $10.4 million judgment? Oh, no, absolutely not. Her attorneys argue Heard never had a fair chance in the courtroom because outside of it, she faced an avalanche of social media backlash, one the jury, they argue, could never avoid. They went home every night. They have families. The families are on social media. It really, really was lopsided. While millions signed an online petition to remove Heard from a starring role in Aquaman 2, Depp received a red carpet-like welcome at court every day. Online, many turn the actor into the hero and heard the villain. Pro Depp hashtags received billions of views. The worldwide reach influencing Heard's claims of abuse, if not in the courtroom, in popular culture. You would be hard pressed to find anybody out there who could give you an opinion that wasn't in some way colored through social media. The appeals process here in Virginia should begin in the coming weeks. It too could be carried live and streamed around the globe. While cases like this aren't new, the coverage is. Tonight, the lurid defamation trial of Johnny Depp may be over, but Hollywood is bracing for a sordid sequel. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Fairfax, Virginia. Miguel Almaguer in Virginia. Miguel, thank you. For more on this blockbuster verdict, let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos now. Danny wrote a piece for Think on NBCNews.com titled, How the Johnny Depp Amber Heard Jury Got It Wrong Twice. 
Uh, so, Danny, that's the essence of what you wrote, that, that this was these were the wrong decisions for this jury to have made two times for both uh, Heard and Depp on this. So let's start with Amber Heard, if we can. Uh, what do you think the jury got wrong in the $15 million judgment against her? Uh, that it should have been zero. Zero for Johnny Depp and zero for Amber Heard in her counterclaim. Uh, when it comes to the case against Amber Heard, uh, it wasn't so much that one person was better or I was a, a supporter of one or the other. It's that defamation in this case uh, had a lot of obstacles mm -hmm. in it. I was surprised that the jury concluded that the Washington Post article was even about Johnny Depp, that it called him an abuser, and that he was able to prove that that statement, whatever that that statement was in the WAPO was false. Keep in mind that uh, if Amber Heard proved that Johnny Depp was abusive once, mm -hmm. not just physically, but in any capacity, then under the law, the jury should have rendered a verdict, a defense verdict for Amber Heard. Johnny Depp should have lost right then and there. It means they believed Zippo, right. nothing of Amber Heard's testimony or her evidence. So do you think the jury held Amber Heard responsible for some things that were out of her control? Yes, I think that they, in finding her not credible, I think that sort of expanded over to her defamation counterclaim mm -hmm. against Johnny Depp, which, by the way, was also an uphill battle because it was based on statements that never came out of Johnny Depp's mouth or his hand or anything like that. It was made by an agent of Johnny Depp's. His and lawyer. yet, they found that at least one statement was defamatory. I think the reason for that is that second statement contained a lot of assertions of fact, and whenever that happens, there are a Lot more facts that could be potentially false, uh, and that's the only way I can see that the jury uh, found def defamation on that second statement and none of the others. But make no mistake about it, it was an overwhelming victory for Johnny Depp, who won on each and every statement that he sued upon uh, as defamatory. So, what did, I mean, what did they get wrong then on his side of the case here with, in making a judgment against her? Uh, th that they concluded that what she said was false. Right. And across the board, and even about Johnny Depp, I think a side issue that didn't get a lot of attention was, how do you know that it's actually, is this article calling Johnny Depp an abuser? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you put that against the fact that we have free speech protections in this country, uh, we should err on the side of requiring a defamation to prove very specifically what is being said. I think reasonable minds could look at that WAPO article and differ as to what is being said. She certainly never came out and said, Johnny Depp punched me in the face. She never even mentioned Johnny Depp. Right. So, uh, look, the one thing I found about this case is so many people viewed the evidence differently. Reasonable minds came to different conclusions. I came to mine. Many other very smart people came to different conclusions. And I think that's sort of the takeaway from this, is that people saw ultimately what they saw. So, as we look ahead, Amber Heard's attorneys have said that they plan to appeal this case. They say uh, that Heard didn't get a fair trial because of social media, the social media reaction. What do you make of that argument for her lawyers going forward? It's an uphill battle. Any appeal is always an uphill battle. The rules are stacked against you. You got to have a really good reason to have an appellate court take away a jury's verdict. They are loath to do that. So you really have to have a major issue on appeal. And pre-trial or during trial publicity could be a potential reason. But in our modern time, you need something that is just overwhelmingly affecting, a, creating a circus-like atmosphere in the courtroom. And, you know, those kinds of appeals have been successful. I think I can count all of them mm. on one hand. That's how rare that is. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos, thank you. Coming up, what do Jeff Bezos, Kylie Jenner, and LeBron James all have in common? The major milestone the NBA superstar just passed off the court when we come back. Back now with Top Stories news feed and an update on that mass shooting at a Buffalo supermarket where 10 people, 10 black people died. The suspect there, Peyton Gendron, pleaded not guilty to a 25-count indictment, including 10 first-degree murder charges. He's also charged with a domestic act of terrorism motivated by hate. He is the first defendant ever to face that charge in New York. It carries an automatic life sentence. Disgraced attorney Michael Avenatti sentenced to four years in prison for stealing from his former client, Stormy Daniels. In February, he was convicted of pocketing nearly $300,000 in book proceeds from the former adult film star. Avenatti represented Daniels while she was suing former President Donald Trump 
Avenatti is already serving a prison sentence for extorting Nike. The FDA announcing more baby formula will soon be available as that nationwide shortage worsens. The FDA says about 250,000 cans will be distributed in June and July. This comes as new data shows 74% of the country's baby formula supply is out of stock. Ten states actually now have an out-of-stock rate at 90% or higher. And LeBron James continues to break records on and off the court. The basketball superstar officially a billionaire now, becoming the first active NBA player to hit that milestone. According to Forbes, James earned more than $120 million last year. Those earnings coming from his NBA salary, endorsement deals, and other business ventures, including his leading role in the new Space Jam. Now to a high-flying mystery in Wisconsin, a hot air balloon colliding with a moving train. Witnesses saying that balloon was flying unusually low in a residential area. Now investigators are trying to figure out how it all happened. NBC's Stephen Romo has more. Tonight, federal investigators still trying to piece together what led a hot air balloon to collide with a moving train, sending three people to the hospital. I noticed a blue and green hot air balloon coming, you know, headed north, descending very, very low into, into a residential area. It happened in Burlington, Wisconsin on Wednesday. Burlington Police Chief Brian Mazensky saying in a statement, early reports from witnesses on scene indicate the hot air balloon appeared in distress and collided with a northbound Canadian national train. Police adding Thursday that the gondola touched down and then the balloon became entangled with that train. When the uh, balloon, though, is coming in for a landing, like you mentioned, is it difficult to maneuver and control in a situation like this? No. So, so balloons control, a, a hot air balloon pilot can control a balloon within a couple inches altitude wise. Emergency crews headed to the scene around 8 15 p.m. Three patients, all conscious. One was serious injuries. Once there, authorities requested two of the passengers be airlifted to the hospital due to their injuries. The third was transported by ground. Those three patients have now all been released from the hospital and are recovering, according to Burlington Police. The freight transportation company, Canadian National Train, declined to comment and referred questions to local authorities. Hot air balloons are not an uncommon sight in that area. You see them occasionally during the summertime, maybe in the late summer or early fall, but they're usually at very high altitudes and sometimes in groups, you know. So it is not unusual to have a low flying balloon uh, for that last 20 minutes of flight. Sometimes there's a, a rare anomaly that's uncontrollable like this. The collision is still under investigation and the Burlington Police Department is working with the FAA and National Transportation Safety Board to figure out the cause. And Stephen Romo joins us now. Stephen, a really scary situation for folks in that area. Any idea at this point when we might get some answers about how this happened? Yeah, we know those federal authorities are investigating. So we could get some preliminary details in as little as two weeks, but it could be as much as a year. That's how it's been for similar investigations until we get the full report about exactly what happened. But I did want to mention the Balloon Federation of America. They did release a statement today saying that they're concerned for the victims, of course, but pointing out just how unusual it is for a hot air balloon yeah. to collide with a moving train. Just a very bizarre situation. Strange indeed. All right, Stephen Romo. Stephen, appreciate it. Thanks. Time now for Top Stories Global Watch, and we begin with two earthquakes rocking southwestern China. New video showing students taking cover under their desks and then evacuating their classrooms. One of those quakes killing at least four people and injuring 14 others. And El Salvador being accused of human rights violations amid a controversial gang crackdown. A new report by Amnesty International accusing the government of arbitrary arrests, violating due process, torture and other mistreatment. 36,000 people were arrested since March. That's about 2% of the country's entire adult population. So far, at least 18 people have died in custody. And as we focus now on stories from the U.S. and Latin America, tonight, a search and rescue operation, operation underway in Colombia. A group of coal miners trapped hundreds of feet underground, an explosion leaving one man dead and more than a dozen stranded in the rubble. Isa Gutierrez has more. Tonight, rescue teams in Colombia are in a race against time as they fight to save a dozen trapped miners who have been stuck in a coal mine since Monday. Tratemos de que todos en equipo podemos lograr, eh, digamos, salvar, salvaguardar la vida de esos mineros. Horrifying images from the aftermath of the explosion that trapped the workers hundreds of feet underground. 
Families and friends of the victims anxiously waiting right outside the mine for any update on their loved ones. As searchers work night and day to get them out. <laughs> The deadly explosion took place in eastern Colombia on the border with Venezuela. The miners were nearly 900 feet underground when a buildup of gases caused the explosion, killing one person that was entering the tunnel at the time, according to local police. Noticias Telemundo reporting he died of injuries relating to the accident. 85% of his body was burned. Rescue teams now putting their own lives on the line to make sure everyone gets out in time. Por la parte de atrás están mirando cómo abrir también y remover para poder ingresar por ese sector y dar ventilación también por ese sector. Tener una mejor ventilación porque el peligro es, eh, es evitar también una intoxicación en los rescatistas. Eso es lo que se ha dificultado muchísimo. Colombia is no stranger to these tragic incidents. The nation reported 148 deaths in mining accidents in 2021. Officials say efforts continue to rescue the 13 people still trapped in the mine. And Isa Gutierrez joins us now. So, Isa, we saw in your piece there about, what, 150 people died in mine accidents last year in Colombia. Is this year shaping up to be just as dangerous? Aaron, unfortunately, the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. So in this particular region that we're talking about so far this year, there have been seven explosions at coal mines that have killed at least 10 people. But when you look at Colombia as a whole, in just the first couple of months of 2022, nearly 40 people died in mining accidents. So sadly, this is something that is not uncommon there. And it's something that's concerning to voters, so much so that recently presidential candidates have promised stricter environmental guidelines to address this issue in their platforms. All right, Issa Gutierrez is with us tonight. Issa, thank you. Now, new worries about Queen Elizabeth's health following late word that she will not attend a church service tomorrow that's part of her platinum jubilee. Keir Simmons is in London for her historic milestone. Tonight, after a magical day, 70 years in the making, news that will worry many. The palace says the Queen will skip a jubilee event tomorrow because of discomfort she felt at today's ceremony. She was too frail to go down to inspect the troops, so they came to her, saluting her on the Buckingham Palace balcony. An historic day for the Queen, but also the dawning of a new era. Charles, William and Anne riding horses, just as the Queen did in decades past. The Prince of Wales standing in for his mother for trooping the colour with 1,500 soldiers, 250 horses and 400 musicians. Harry and Meghan looking on, though they were not included in the big moment to come. And there they are, Kate and Camilla and William and Kate's children cheered by the crowds, heading back to Buckingham Palace to pay their respects to the Queen. Back on the balcony, the Queen smiling and a perfect 70 in the air from the Royal Air Force, surrounded by four generations of royals. William and Kate's son, Prince Louis's reaction to the flyover, stealing the show. His mother and great-grandmother, amazingly relaxed. Did you see her? We saw the Queen in the distance. It was yeah. all amazing. Oh, it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it really was great. Late today, the Queen lighting a beacon. A day when the past was acknowledged with pride, the future faced with purpose. And still overseeing it all, monarch and matriarch, now in her eighth decade, Queen Elizabeth II. The event the Queen will miss tomorrow, a service at St Paul's Cathedral, which would have meant so much to her, her absence will be truly felt. Keir Simmons joins us now from London. Uh, Keir, we know the palace is notoriously tight-lipped, especially when it comes to the Queen's health. How concerning is it that she's withdrawing from tomorrow's events, though? Well, I think it is concerning. I think it will concern uh, many people. I think it will be deeply disappointing for the Queen herself. The service that she will not attend at St Paul's Cathedral tomorrow may have been the most important event for her of all of these Platinum Jubilee celebrations, because we know how important to her her faith is. So I suspect that's why they've only announced this at the last possible moment, because she would have so much wanted to get there. Now, of course, we're standing on the mile here. She wasn't able to make it to the parade 
parade ground at the other end of the mall. Buckingham Palace is just behind me there. So for her to get across London to St Paul's Cathedral, that was clearly uh, too much. But there will be people who saw her today and saw how well she looked, but will also be worried that she is not able to make this event tomorrow. Keir Simmons in London tonight. Keir, thank you. And when we come back, big cat in the classroom. The mountain lion discovered inside a high school the employee who stepped in for an expulsion. Stay with us. Well, tonight, the strange saga of a mountain lion that somehow was trapped in a California classroom is over. That wild cat has been safely captured and taken to the Oakland Zoo to get checked out. Ian Cull of NBC Bay Area brings us the story. Tonight, this six to eight month old mountain lion is in good hands, being treated by veterinarians at the Oakland Zoo ICU. Certainly not how he nor the students at Pescadero High School expected the day to end. The cub was found inside a classroom this morning, cozying up next to a desk. I spoke with a vet treating him. Um, this cat's been starving for a while. Um, they stay with their mothers till they're two years old. So uh, he's obviously been on his own for a bit and lost his mom. Um, she probably was hit by a car. Dr. Alex Herman says the little guy is about 25 pounds and should be 45. He's anemic and dehydrated, which could have led to his unusual behavior. They're very curious, but they're also very, very shy. When they're sick, they don't make decisions that are as good as when they're not sick. It certainly woke up everyone walking into the high school when a custodian spotted the cub 10 minutes before school. Definitely not what I was expecting today when I came to school. I was playing some tough finals, but uh, not in my line. Students and staff were forced to shelter in place before getting dismissed early. They were taken to an elementary school where their parents picked them up. I honestly thought it was a senior prank at first because <laughs> it is the day before school is out. Um, but I quickly learned based on the source of the information that that was not the case. Dr. Herman says the cub is too young to be sent back into the wild. Yeah. So he'll rehab in the ICU for a few weeks and may stay in Oakland or be sent to another zoo. And while it was an unusual day in Pescadero, it was probably the best thing for this baby mountain lion. No one's heard or anything like that, but it was good for his health that he was found like this. It's really good that he came in. So, you know, yeah. we're saving his life. Ian Cole, NBC Bay Area News. Thank you for joining us for Top Story tonight. For Tom Yamas, I'm Aaron Gilchrist in New York. Stay right there. More news is on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.